Part three of Lady Byron Vindicated A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Here included are miscellaneous documents, section one being the true story of Lady Byron's life as originally published in the Atlantic Monthly. Part two of three two years after lord byron's refusal by miss milbank his various friends seeing that for some cause he was wretched pressed marriage upon him marriage has often been represented as the proper goal and terminus of a wild and dissipated career and it has been supposed to be the appointed mission of good women to receive wandering prodigals with all the rags and disgraces of their old life upon them and put rings on their hands and shoes on their feet and introduce them clothed and in their right minds to an honourable career in society marriage was therefore universally recommended to lord byron by his numerous friends and well-wishers and so he determined to marry and in an hour of reckless desperation sat down and wrote proposals to two ladies one was declined the other which was accepted was to miss milbank the world knows well that he had the gift of expression and will not be surprised that he wrote a very beautiful letter and that the woman who had already learned to love him fell at once into its snare her answer was a frank outspoken avowal of her love for him giving herself to him heart and hand the good in lord byron was not so utterly obliterated that he could receive such a letter without emotion or practise such unfairness on a loving trusting heart without pangs of remorse he had sent the letter in mere recklessness he had not seriously expected to be accepted and the discovery of the treasure of affection which he had secured was like a vision of lost heaven to a soul in hell but nevertheless in his letters written about the engagement there are sufficient evidences that his self-love was flattered at the preference accorded him by so superior a woman and one who had been so much sought he mentions with an air of complacency that she has employed the last two years in refusing five or six of his acquaintance that he had no idea she loved him admitting that it was an old attachment on his part he dwells on her virtues with a sort of pride of ownership there is a sort of childish levity about the frankness of these letters very characteristic of the man who skimmed over the deepest abysses with the lightest jests before the world and to his intimates he was acting the part of the successful fiance conscious all the while of the deadly secret that lay cold at the bottom of his heart when he went to visit miss milbank's parents as her accepted lover she was struck with his manner and appearance she saw him moody and gloomy evidently wrestling with dark and desperate thoughts and anything but what a happy and accepted lover should be she sought an interview with him alone and told him that she had observed that he was not happy in the engagement and magnanimously added that if on review he found he had been mistaken in the nature of his feelings she would immediately release him and they should remain only friends overcome with the conflict of his feelings lord byron fainted away miss milbank was convinced that his heart must really be deeply involved in an attachment with reference to which he showed such strength of emotion and she spoke no more of a dissolution of the engagement there is no reason to doubt that byron was as he relates in his dream profoundly agonized and agitated when he stood before god's altar with the trusting young creature whom he was leading to a fate so awfully tragic yet it was not the memory of mary chaworth but another guiltier and more damning memory that overshadowed that hour the moment the carriage doors were shut upon the bridegroom and the bride the paroxysm of remorse and despair unrepentant remorse and angry despair broke forth upon her gentle head you might have saved me from this madam you had all in your power when i offered myself to you first then you might have made me what you pleased but now you will find that you have married a devil 
in miss martineau's sketches recently published is an account of the termination of this wedding journey which brought them to one of lady byron's ancestral country seats where they were to spend the honeymoon miss martineau says quote, at the altar she did not know that she was a sacrifice but before sunset of that winter day she knew it if a judgment may be formed from her face and attitude of despair when she alighted from the carriage on the afternoon of her marriage day it was not the traces of tears which won the sympathy of the old butler who stood at the open door the bridegroom jumped out of the carriage and walked away the bride alighted and came up the steps alone with a countenance and frame agonized and listless with evident horror and despair the old servant longed to offer his arm to the young lonely creature as an assurance of sympathy and protection from this shock she certainly rallied and soon the pecuniary difficulties of her new home were exactly what a devoted spirit like hers was fitted to encounter her husband bore testimony after the catastrophe that a brighter being a more sympathizing and agreeable companion never blessed any man's home when he afterward called her cold and mathematical and over pious and so forth it was when public opinion had gone against him and when he had discovered that her fidelity and mercy her silence and magnanimity might be relied on so that he was at full liberty to make his part good as far as she was concerned silent she was even to her own parents whose feelings she magnanimously spared she did not act rashly in leaving him though she had been most rash in marrying him not all at once did the full knowledge of the dreadful reality in which she had entered come upon the young wife she knew vaguely from the wild avowals of the first hours of their marriage that there was a dreadful secret of guilt that byron's soul was torn with agonies of remorse and that he had no love to give her in return for a love which was ready to do and dare all for him yet bravely she addressed herself to the task of soothing and pleasing and calming the man whom she had taken for better or for worse young and gifted with a peculiar air of refined and spiritual beauty graceful in every movement possessed of exquisite taste a perfect companion to his mind in all the higher walks of literary culture and with that infinite pliability to all his varying capricious moods which true love alone can give bearing in her hand a princely fortune with which a woman's uncalculating generosity was thrown at his feet there is no wonder that she might feel for a while as if she could enter the lists with the very devil himself and fight with a woman's weapons for the heart of her husband there are indications scattered through the letters of lord byron which though brief indeed showed that his young wife was making every effort to accommodate herself to him and to give him a cheerful home one of the poems that he sends to his publisher about this time he speaks of as being copied by her he had always the highest regard for her literary judgments and opinions and this little incident shows that she was already associating herself in a wifely fashion with his aims as an author the poem copied by her however has a sad meaning which she afterwards learned to understand only too well Quote, there's not a joy the world can give like that it takes away when the glow of early thought declines in feelings dull decay tis not on youth's smooth cheek the blush alone that fades so fast but the tender bloom of heart is gone ere youth itself be past then the few whose spirits float above the wreck of happiness are driven o'er the shoals of guilt or ocean of excess the magnet of their course is gone are only points in vain the shore to which their shivered sail shall never stretch again End quote. only a few days before she left him forever lord byron sent murray manuscripts in lady byron's handwriting of the siege of corinth and parisina and wrote quote, i am very glad that the handwriting was a favorable omen of the morale of the piece but you must not trust to that for my copyist would write out anything i desired in all the ignorance of innocence End quote. 
there were lucid intervals in which lord byron felt the charm of his wife's mind and the strength of her powers quote, bell you could be a poet too if you only thought so he would say there were summer hours in her stormy life the memory of which never left her when byron was as gentle and tender as he was beautiful when he seemed to be possessed by a good angel and then for a little time all the ideal possibilities of his nature stood revealed the most dreadful men to live with are those who thus alternate between angel and devil the buds of hope and love called out by a day or two of sunshine are frozen again and again till the tree is killed but there came an hour of revelation an hour when in a manner which left no kind of room for doubt lady byron saw the full depth of the abyss of infamy which her marriage was expected to cover and understood that she was expected to be the cloak and the accomplice of this infamy many women would have been utterly crushed by such a disclosure some would have fled from him immediately and exposed and denounced his crime lady byron did neither when all the hope of womanhood died out of her heart there arose within her stronger purer and brighter that immortal kind of love such as god feels for the sinner the love of which jesus spoke and which holds the one wanderer of more account than the ninety and nine that went not astray she would neither leave her husband nor betray him nor yet would she for one moment justify his sin and hence came two years of convulsive struggle in which sometimes for a while the good angel seemed to gain ground and then the evil one returned with sevenfold vehemence lord byron argued his case with himself and with her with all the sophistries of his powerful mind he repudiated christianity as authority asserted the right of every human being to follow out what he called the impulses of nature subsequently he introduced into one of his dramas the reasoning by which he justified himself in incest in the drama of cain ada the sister and wife of cain thus addressed him cain walk not with this spirit bear with what we have borne and love me i love thee lucifer more than thy mother and thy sire ada i do is that a sin too lucifer no not yet it one day will be in your children ada what must not my daughter love her brother enoch lucifer not as thou lovest cain ada oh my god shall they not love and bring forth things that love out of their love have they not drawn their milk out of this bosom was not he their father born of the same soul womb in the same hour with me did we not love each other and in multiplying our being multiply things which will love each other as we love them and as i love thee my cain go not forth with this spirit he is not of ours lucifer the sin i speak of is not of my making and cannot be a sin in you whate'er it seems in those who will replace ye in mortality ada what is the sin which is not sin in itself can circumstance make sin of virtue if it doth we are the slaves of End quote lady byron though slight and almost infantile in her bodily presence had the soul not only of an angelic woman but of a strong reasoning man it was this writer's lot to know her at a period when she formed the personal acquaintance of many of the very first minds of england but among all with whom this experience brought her in connection there was none who impressed her so strongly as lady byron there was an almost supernatural power of moral divination a grasp of the very highest and most comprehensive things that made her lightest opinions singularly impressive no doubt this result was wrought out in a great degree from the anguish and conflict of these two years when with no one to help or counsel her but almighty god she wrestled and struggled with fiends of darkness for redemption of her husband's soul she followed him through all his sophistical reasonings with a keener reason she besought and implored in the name of his better nature and by all the glorious things that he was capable of being and doing and she had just power enough to convulse and shake and agonize but not power enough to subdue 
one of the first living writers in the novel of romola has given in her masterly sketch of the character of tito the whole history of the conflict of a woman like lady byron with a nature like that of her husband she has described a being full of fascinations and sweetnesses full of generosities and of good-natured impulses a nature that could not bear to give pain or to see it in others but entirely destitute of any firm moral principle she shows how such a being merely by yielding step by step to the impulses of passion and disregarding the claims of truth and right becomes involved in a fatality of evil in which deceit crime and cruelty are a necessity forcing him to persist in the basest ingratitude to the father who has done all for him and hard-hearted treachery to the high-minded wife who has given herself to him wholly there are few scenes in literature more fearfully tragic than the one between romola and tito when he finally discovers that she knows him fully and can be deceived by him no more some such hour always must come for strong decided natures irrevocably pledged one to the service of good and the other to the slavery of evil the demoniac cried out what have i to do with thee jesus of nazareth art thou come to torment me before the time the presence of all pitying purity and love was a torture to the soul possessed by the demon of evil these two years in which lady byron was with all her soul struggling to bring her husband back to his better self were a series of passionate convulsions during this time such was the disordered and desperate state of his worldly affairs that there were ten executions for debt levied on their family establishment and it was lady byron's fortune each time which settled the account toward the last she and her husband saw less and less of each other and he came more and more decidedly under evil influences and seemed to acquire a sort of hatred of her lady byron once said significantly to a friend who spoke of some causeless dislike in another my dear i have known people to be hated for no other reason than because they impersonated conscience the biographers of lord byron and all his apologists are careful to narrate how sweet and amiable and obliging he was to everybody who approached him and the saying of fletcher his manservant that anybody could do anything with my lord except my lady has often been quoted the reason of all this will now be evident my lady was the only one fully understanding the deep and dreadful secrets of his life who had the courage resolutely and persistently and inflexibly to plant herself in his way and insist upon it that if he went to destruction it should be in spite of her best efforts he had tried his strength with her fully the first attempt had been to make her an accomplice by sophistry by destroying her faith in christianity and confusing her sense of right and wrong to bring her into the ranks of those convenient women who regard the marriage tie only as a friendly alliance to cover licenses on both sides when her husband described to her the continental latitude the good-humoured marriage in which complacent couples mutually agreed to form the cloak for each other's infidelities and gave her to understand that in that way alone could she have a peaceful and friendly life with him she answered him simply i am too truly your friend to do this when lord byron found that he had to do with one who would not yield who knew him fully who could not be blinded and could not be deceived he determined to rid himself of her altogether it was when the state of affairs between herself and her husband seemed darkest and most hopeless that the only child of this union was born lord byron's treatment of his wife during the sensitive period that preceded the birth of his child and during her confinement was marked with paroxysms of unmanly brutality for which the only possible charity on her part was the supposition of insanity moore sheds a significant light on this period by telling us that about this time byron was often drunk day after day with his friend richard sheridan there had been insanity in the family and this was the plea which lady byron's love put in for him 
she regarded him as if not insane at least so nearly approaching the boundaries of insanity as to be a subject of forbearance and tender pity and she loved him with that love resembling a mother's which good wives often feel when they have lost all faith in their husband's principles and all hopes of their affections still she was in heart and soul his best friend true to him with a truth which he himself could not shake in the verses addressed to his daughter lord byron speaks of her as quote, the child of love though born in bitterness and nurtured in convulsion End quote. a day or two after the birth of this child lord byron came suddenly into lady byron's room and told her that her mother was dead it was an utter falsehood but it was only one of the many nameless injuries and cruelties by which he expressed his hatred of her a short time after her confinement she was informed by him in a note that as soon as she was able to travel she must go that he could not and would not longer have her about him and when her child was only five weeks old he carried this threat of expulsion into effect here we will insert briefly lady byron's own account the only one she ever gave to the public of this separation the circumstances under which this brief story was written are affecting <clears throat> lord byron was dead the whole account between him and her was closed for ever in this world moore's life had been prepared containing simply and solely lord byron's own version of their story moore sent this version to lady byron and requested to know if she had any remarks to make upon it in reply she sent a brief statement to him the first and only one that had come from her during all the years of the separation and which appears to have mainly for its object the exculpation of her father and mother from the charge made by the poet of being the instigators of the separation in this letter she says with regard to their separation quote, the facts are i left london for kirby mallory the residence of my father and mother on the fifteenth of january eighteen sixteen lord byron had signified to me in writing january sixth his absolute desire that i should leave london on the earliest day that i could conveniently fix it it was not safe for me to undertake the fatigue of a journey sooner than the fifteenth previously to my departure it had been strongly impressed upon my mind that lord byron was under the influence of insanity this opinion was derived in a great measure from the communications made me by his nearest relatives and personal attendant who had more opportunity than myself for observing him during the latter part of my stay in town it was even represented to me that he was in danger of destroying himself with the concurrence of his family i had consulted dr bailey as a friend january eighth respecting the supposed malady on acquainting him with the state of the case and with lord byron's desire that i should leave london dr bailey thought that my absence might be advisable as an experiment assuming the fact of mental derangement for dr bailey not having had access to lord byron could not pronounce a positive opinion on that he enjoined that in correspondence with lord byron i should avoid all but light and soothing topics under these impressions i left london determined to follow the advice given by dr bailey whatever might have been the conduct of lord byron toward me from the time of my marriage yet supposing him to be in a state of mental alienation it was not for me nor for any person of common humanity to manifest at that moment a sense of injury End quote nothing more than this letter from lady byron is necessary to substantiate the fact that she did not leave her husband but was driven from him driven from him that he might give himself up to the guilty infatuation that was consuming him without being tortured by her imploring face and by the silent power of her presence and her prayers for a long time before this she had seen little of him on the day of her departure she passed by the door of his room and stopped to caress his favorite spaniel which was lying there and she confessed to a friend the weakness of feeling a willingness even to be something as humble as that poor little creature might she only be allowed to remain and watch over him she went into the room where he and the partner of his sins were sitting together and said byron i come to say good-bye 
offering at the same time her hand lord byron put his hands behind him retreated to the mantelpiece and looking round on the two that stood there with a sarcastic smile said when shall we three meet again lady byron answered in heaven i trust and those were her last words to him on earth this ends part three section one miscellaneous documents the true story of lady byron's life part two of three read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana part three of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain here included are miscellaneous documents section one being the true story of lady byron's life as originally published in the atlantic monthly part three of three now if the reader wishes to understand the real talents of lord byron for deception and dissimulation let him read with this story in his mind the fare thee well which he addressed to lady byron through the printer Quote, fare thee well and if for ever still for ever fare thee well even though unforgiving never against thee shall my heart rebel would that breast were bared before thee where thy head so oft hath lain while that placid sleep came o'er thee thou canst never know again though my many faults defaced me could no other arm be found than the one which once embraced me to inflict a careless wound End quote. The reaction of society against him at the time of the separation from his wife was something which he had not expected, and for which, it appears, he was entirely unprepared. It broke up the guilty intrigue and drove him from England. He had not courage to meet or endure it. The world, to be sure, was very far from suspecting what the truth was, but the tide was setting against him with such vehemence as to make him tremble every hour lest the whole should be known, and henceforth it became a warfare of desperation to make his story good at no matter whose expense. He had tact enough to perceive at first that the assumption of the pathetic and the magnanimous and general confessions of fault accompanied with admissions of his wife's goodness would be the best policy in his case Quote, the fault was not in my choice unless in choosing at all for i do not believe and i must say it in the very dregs of all this bitter business that there ever was a better or even a brighter a kinder or a more amiable agreeable being than lady byron i never had nor can have any reproach to make her while with me where there is blame it belongs to myself End quote. as there must be somewhere a scapegoat to bear the sin of the affair lord byron wrote a poem called a sketch in which he lays the blame of stirring up strife on a friend and former governess of lady byron's but in this sketch he introduces the following just eulogy on lady byron Quote, foiled was perversion by that youthful mind which flattery fooled not baseness could not blind deceit infect not near contagion soil indulgence weaken nor example spoil nor mastered science tempt her to look down on humbler talents with a pitying frown nor genius swell nor beauty render vain nor envy ruffle to retaliate pain nor fortune change pride raise nor passion bow nor virtue teach austerity till now serenely purest of her sex that live but wanting one sweet weakness to forgive too shocked at faults her soul can never know she deemed that all could be like her below foe to all vice yet hardly virtue's friend for virtue pardons those she would amend End quote. in leaving england lord byron first went to switzerland where he conceived and in part wrote out the tragedy of manfred moore speaks of his domestic misfortunes and the sufferings which he underwent at this time as having an influence in stimulating his genius so that he was enabled to write with greater power 
anybody who reads the tragedy of manfred with this story in mind will see that it is true the hero is represented as a gloomy misanthrope dwelling with impenitent remorse on the memory of an incestuous passion which has been the destruction of his sister for this life and the life to come but which to the very last gasp he despairingly refuses to repent of even while he sees the fiends of darkness rising to take possession of his departing soul that byron knew his own guilt well and judged himself severely may be gathered from passages in this poem which are as powerful as human language can be made for instance this part of the incantation which moore says was written at this time quote, though thy slumber may be deep yet thy spirit shall not sleep there are shades which will not vanish there are thoughts thou canst not banish by a power to the unknown thou canst never be alone thou art wrapped as with a shroud thou art gathered in a cloud and for ever shalt thou dwell in the spirit of this spell from thy false tears i did distill an essence which had strength to kill from thy own heart i then did wring the black blood in its blackest spring from thy own smile i snatched the snake for there it coiled as in a break from thy own lips i drew the charm which gave all these their chiefest harm in proving every poison known i found the strongest was thine own by thy cold breast and serpent smile by thy unfathomed gulfs of guile by thy most seeming virtuous eye by thy shut soul's hypocrisy by the perfections of thine art which passed for human thine own heart by thy delight in others pain and by thy brotherhood of cain i call upon thee and compel thyself to be thy proper hell again he represents manfred as saying to the old abbot who seeks to bring him to repentance old man there is no power in holy men nor charm in prayer nor purifying form of penitence nor outward look nor fast nor agony nor greater than all these the innate tortures of that deep despair which is remorse without the fear of hell but all in all sufficient to itself would make a hell of heaven can exercise from out the unbounded spirit the quick sense of its own sins wrongs sufferance and revenge upon itself there is no future pang can deal that justice on the self-condemned he deals on his own soul and when the abbot tells him all this is well for this will pass away and be succeeded by an auspicious hope which shall look up with calm assurance to that blessed place which all who seek may win whatever be their earthly errors he answers it is too late then the old abbot soliloquizes this should have been a noble creature he hath all the energy which would have made a goodly frame of glorious elements had they been wisely mingled as it is it is an awful chaos light and darkness and mind and dust and passions and pure thoughts mixed and contending without end or order the world can easily see in moore's biography what after this was the course of lord byron's life how he went from shame to shame and dishonour to dishonour and used the fortune which his wife brought him in the manner described in those private letters which his biographer was left to print moore indeed says byron had made the resolution not to touch his lady's fortune but adds that it required more self-command than he possessed to carry out so honourable a purpose lady byron made but one condition with him she had him in her power and she exacted that the unhappy partner of his sins should not follow him out of england and that the ruinous intrigue should be given up her inflexibility on this point kept up that enmity which was constantly expressing itself in some publication or other and which drew her and her private relations with him before the public the story of what lady byron did with the portion of her fortune which was reserved to her is a record of noble and skilfully administered charities p 
pitiful and wise and strong there was no form of human suffering or sorrow that did not find with her refuge and help she gave not only systematically but also impulsively miss martin knew claims for her the honor of having first invented practical schools in which the children of the poor were turned into agriculturalists artisans seamstresses and good wives for poor men while she managed with admirable skill and economy permanent institutions of this sort she was always ready to relieve suffering in any form the fugitive slaves william and ellen crafts escaping to london were fostered by her protecting care in many cases where there was disaster or anxiety from poverty among those too self-respecting to make their sufferings known the delicate hand of lady byron ministered to the want with a consideration that spared the most refined feelings as a mother her course was embarrassed by peculiar trials the daughter inherited from the father not only brilliant talents but a restlessness and morbid sensibility which might be too surely traced to the storms and agitations of the period in which she was born it was necessary to bring her up in ignorance of the true history of her mother's life and the consequence was that she could not fully understand that mother during her early girlhood her career was a source of more anxiety than of comfort she married a man of fashion ran a brilliant course as a gay woman of fashion and died early of a lingering and painful disease in the silence and shaded retirement of the sick-room the daughter came wholly back to her mother's arms and heart and it was on that mother's bosom that she leaned as she went down into the dark valley it was that mother who placed her weak and dying hand in that of her almighty saviour to the children left by her daughter lady byron ministered with the faithfulness of a guardian angel and it is owing to her influence that those who yet remain are among the best and noblest of mankind the person whose relations with byron had been so disastrous also in the latter years of her life felt lady byron's loving and ennobling influences and in her last sickness and dying hours looked to lady byron for consolation and help there was an unfortunate child of sin born with the curse upon her over whose wayward nature lady byron watched with a mother's tenderness she was the one who could have patience when the patience of every one else failed and though her task was a difficult one from the strange abnormal propensities to evil in the object of her cares yet lady byron never faltered and never gave over till death took the responsibility from her hands during all this trial strange to say her belief that the good in lord byron would finally conquer was unshaken to a friend who said to her oh how could you love him she answered briefly my dear there was an angel in him it is in us all it was in this angel that she had faith it was for the deliverance of this angel from degradation and shame and sin that she unceasingly prayed she read every work that byron wrote read it with a deeper knowledge than any human being but herself could possess the ribaldry and the obscenity and the insults with which he strove to make her ridiculous in the world fell at her pitying feet unheeded when he broke away from all this unworthy life to devote himself to a manly enterprise for the redemption of greece she thought that she saw the beginning of an answer to her prayers even although one of his latest acts concerning her was to repeat to lady blessington the false accusation which made lady byron the author of all his errors she still had hopes from that one step taken in the right direction in the midst of these hopes came the news of his sudden death on his deathbed it is well known that he called his confidential english servant to him and said to him go to my sister tell her go to lady byron you will see her and say here followed twenty minutes of indistinct mutterings in which the names of his wife daughter and sister frequently occurred then he said now i have told you all my lord replied fletcher i have not understood a word your lordship has been saying 
not understand me exclaimed lord byron with a look of utmost distress what a pity then it is too late all is over he afterwards says more tried to utter a few words of which none were intelligible except my sister my child when fletcher returned to london lady byron sent for him and walked the room in convulsive struggles to repress her tears and sobs while she over and over again strove to elicit something from him which should enlighten her upon what that last message had been but in vain the gates of eternity were shut in her face and not a word had passed to tell her if he had repented for all that lady byron never doubted his salvation ever before her during the few remaining years of her widowhood was the image of her husband purified and ennobled with the shadows of earth forever dissipated the stains of sin forever removed the angel in him as she expressed it made perfect according to its divine ideal never has more divine strength of faith and love existed in woman out of the depths of her own loving and merciful nature she gained such views of the divine love and mercy as made all hopes possible there was no soul whose future lady byron despaired such was her boundless faith in the redeeming power of love after byron's death the life of this delicate creature so frail in body that she seemed always hovering on the brink of the eternal world yet so strong in spirit and so unceasing in her various ministries of mercy was a miracle of mingled weakness and strength to talk with her seemed to the writer of this sketch the nearest possible approach to talking with one of the spirits of the just made perfect she was gentle artless approachable as a little child with ready outflowing sympathies for the cares and sorrows and interests of all who approached her with a naive and gentle playfulness that adorned without hiding the breadth and strength of her mind and above all with a clear divining moral discrimination never mistaking wrong for right in the slightest shade yet with a mercifulness that made allowance for every weakness and pitied every sin there was so much of christ in her that to have seen her seemed to be to have drawn near to heaven she was one of those few whom absence cannot estrange from friends whose mere presence in this world seems always a help to every generous thought a strength to every good purpose a comfort in every sorrow living so near the confines of the spiritual world she seemed already to see into it hence the words of comfort which she addressed to a friend who had lost a son dear friend remember as long as our loved ones are in god's world they are in ours it has been thought by some friends who have read the proof sheets of the foregoing that this author should state more specifically her authority for these statements the circumstances which led this writer to england at a certain time originated a friendship and correspondence with lady byron which was always regarded as one of the greatest acquisitions of that visit on the occasion of a second visit to england in eighteen fifty six the writer received a note from lady byron indicating that she wished to have some private confidential conversation upon important subjects and inviting her for that purpose to spend a day with her at her country seat near london the writer went and spent a day with lady byron alone and the object of the invitation was explained to her lady byron was in such a state of health that her physicians had warned her that she had very little time to live she was engaged in those duties and retrospections which every thoughtful person finds necessary when coming deliberately and with open eyes to the boundaries of this mortal life at that time there was a cheap edition of byron's works in contemplation intended to bring his writings into circulation among the masses and the pathos arising from the story of his domestic misfortunes was one great means relied on for giving it currency under these circumstances some of lady byron's friends had proposed the question to her whether she had not a responsibility to society for the truth 
whether she did right to allow these writings to gain influence over the popular mind by giving a silent consent to what she knew to be utter falsehoods lady byron's whole life had been passed in the most heroic self-abnegation and self-sacrifice and she had now to consider whether one more act of self-denial was not required of her before leaving this world namely to declare the absolute truth no matter at what expense to her own feelings for this reason it was her desire to recount the whole history to a person of another country and entirely out of the sphere of personal and local feelings which might be supposed to influence those in the country and station in life where the events really happened in order that she might be helped by such a person's view in making up an opinion as to her own duty the interview had almost the solemnity of a deathbed avowal lady byron stated the facts which have been embodied in this article and gave to the writer a paper containing a brief memorandum of the whole with the dates affixed we have already spoken of that singular sense of the reality of the spiritual world which seemed to encompass lady byron during the last part of her life and which made her words and actions seem more like those of a blessed being detached from earth than of an ordinary mortal all her modes of looking at things all her motives of action all her involuntary exhibitions of emotion were so high above any common level and so entirely regulated by the most unworldly causes that it would seem difficult to make the ordinary world understand exactly how the thing seemed to lie before her mind what impressed the writer more strongly than anything else was lady byron's perfect conviction that her husband was now a redeemed spirit that he looked back with pain and shame and regret on all that was unworthy in his past life and that if he could speak or could act in the case he would desire to prevent the farther circulation of base falsehoods and of seductive poetry which had been made the vehicle of morbid and unworthy passions lady byron's experience had led her to apply the powers of her strong philosophical mind to the study of mental pathology and she had become satisfied that the solution of the painful problem which first occurred to her as a young wife was after all the true one namely that lord byron had been one of those unfortunately constituted persons in whom the balance of nature is so critically hung that it is always in danger of dipping towards insanity and that in certain periods of his life he was so far under the influence of mental disorder as not to be fully responsible for his actions she went over with a brief and clear analysis the history of his whole life as she had thought it out during the lonely musings of her widowhood she dwelt on the ancestral causes that gave him a nature of exceptional and dangerous susceptibility she went through the mismanagements of his childhood the history of his school days the influence of the ordinary school course of classical reading on such a mind as his she sketched boldly and clearly the internal life of the young man of the time as she with her pure eyes had looked through it and showed how habits which with less susceptible fibre and coarser strength of nature were tolerable for his companions were deadly to him unhinging his nervous system and intensifying the dangers of ancestral proclivities lady byron expressed the feeling too that the calvinistic theology as heard in scotland had proved in his case as it often does in certain minds a subtle poison he never could either disbelieve or become reconciled to it and the sore problems it poses embittered his spirit against christianity the worst of it is i do believe he would often say with violence when he had been employing all his powers of reason wit and ridicule upon the subjects through all this sorrowful history was to be seen not the care of a slandered woman to make her story good but the pathetic anxiety of a mother who treasures every particle of hope every intimation of good in the son whom she cannot cease to love with indescribable resignation she dwelt on those last hours those words addressed to her never to be understood till repeated in eternity but all this she looked upon as forever past 
believing that with the dropping of the earthly life these morbid impulses and influences ceased and that higher nature which he often so beautifully expressed in his poems became the triumphant one while speaking on this subject her pale ethereal face became luminous with a heavenly radiance there was something so sublime in her belief in the victory of love over evil that faith with her seemed to have become sight she seemed so clearly to perceive the divine ideal of the man she had loved and for whose salvation she had been called to suffer and labor and pray that all memories of his past unworthiness fell away and were lost her love was never the doting fondness of weak women it was the appreciative and discriminating love by which a higher nature recognized godlike capabilities under all the dust and defilement of misuse and passion and she never doubted that the love which in her was so strong that no injury or insult could shake it was yet stronger in the god who made her capable of such a devotion and that in him it was accompanied by power to subdue all things to itself the writer was so impressed and excited by the whole scene and recital that she begged for two or three days to deliberate before forming any opinion she took the memorandum with her returned to london and gave a day or two to the consideration of the subject the decision which she made was chiefly influenced by her reverence and affection for lady byron who seemed so frail she had suffered so much she stood at such a height above the comprehension of the coarse and common world that the author had a feeling that it would almost be like violating a shrine to ask her to come forth from the sanctuary of a silence where she had so long abode and plead her cause she wrote to lady byron that while this act of justice did seem to be called for and to be in some respects most desirable yet as it would involve so much that was painful to her the writer considered that lady byron would be entirely justifiable in leaving the truth to be disclosed after her death and recommended that all the facts necessary should be put in the hands of some person to be so published years passed on lady byron lingered four years after this interview to the wonder of her physicians and all her friends after lady byron's death the writer looked anxiously hoping to see a memoir of the person whom she considered the most remarkable woman that england has produced in a century no such memoir has appeared on the part of her friend and the mistress of lord byron has the ear of the public and is sowing far and wide unworthy slanders which are eagerly gathered up and read by an undiscriminating community there may be family reasons in england which prevent lady byron's friends from speaking but lady byron has an american name and an american existence and reverence for pure womanhood is we think a national characteristic of the american and so far as this country is concerned we feel that the public should have this refutation of the slanders of the countess guiccioli's book this ends part three section one miscellaneous documents the true story of lady byron's life part three of three read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana part three chapter two of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy by harriet beecher stowe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 in this miscellaneous documents collection Lord Lindsay's Letter to the London Times. To the editor of the Times, Sir, I have been waiting in expectation of a categorical denial of the horrible charge brought by Mrs. Beecher Stowe against Lord Byron and his sister on the alleged authority of the late Lady Byron such denial has been only indirectly given by the letter of messrs wharton and fords in your impression of yesterday that letter is sufficient to prove that lady byron never contemplated the use made of her name and that her descendants and representatives disclaim any countenance of mrs b stowe's article but it does not specifically meet mrs stowe's allegation that lady byron in conversing with her thirteen years ago affirmed the charge now before us 
it remains open therefore to a scandal-loving world to credit the calumny through the advantage of this flaw involuntary i believe in the answer produced against it my object in addressing you is to supply that deficiency by proving that what is now stated on lady byron's supposed authority is at variance in all respects with what she stated immediately after the separation when everything was fresh in her memory in relation to the time during which according to mrs b stowe she believed that byron and his sister were living together in guilt i publish this evidence with reluctance but in obedience to that higher obligation of justice to the voiceless and defenceless dead which bids me break through a reserve that otherwise i should have held sacred the lady byron of eighteen eighteen would i am certain have sanctioned my doing so had she foreseen the present unparalleled occasion and the bar that the conditions of her will present as i infer from Messrs. wharton and ford's letter against any fuller communication calumnies such as the present sink deep and with rapidity into the public mind and are not easily eradicated the fame of one of our greatest poets and that of the kindest and truest and most constant friend that byron ever had is at stake and it will not do to wait for revelations from the fountain-head which are not promised and possibly may never reach us the late lady anne bernard who died in eighteen twenty five a contemporary and friend of burke wyndham dundas and a host of the wise and good of that generation and remembered in letters as the authoress of old robin gray had known the late lady byron from infancy and took a warm interest in her holding lord byron in corresponding repugnance not to say prejudice in consequence of what she believed to be his harsh and cruel treatment of her young friend i transcribe the following passages and a letter from lady byron herself written in eighteen eighteen from recordy or private family memoirs in lady anne's autograph now before me i include the letter because although treating only in general terms of the matter and causes of the separation it affords collateral evidence bearing strictly upon the point of the credibility of the charge now in question quoting lady bernard's letter the separation of lord and lady byron astonished the world which believed him a reformed man as to his habits and a becalmed man as to his remorses he had written nothing that appeared after his marriage until the famous fare thee well which had the power of compelling those to pity the writer who were not well aware that he was not the unhappy person he affected to be lady byron's misery was whispered soon after her marriage and his ill usage but no word transpired no sign escaped from her she gave birth shortly to a daughter and when she went as soon as she was recovered on a visit to her father's taking her little ada with her no one knew that it was to return to her lord no more at that point a severe fit of illness had confined me to bed for two months i heard of lady byron's distress of the pains he took to give a harsh impression of her character to the world i wrote to her and entreated her to come and let me see and hear her if she conceived my sympathy or counsel could be any comfort to her she came but what a tale was unfolded by this interesting young creature who had so fondly hoped to have made a young man of genius and romance as she supposed happy they had not been an hour in the carriage which conveyed them from the church when breaking into a malignant sneer oh what a dupe you have been to your imagination how is it possible a woman of your sense could form the wild hope of reforming me many are the tears you will have to shed ere that plan is accomplished it is enough for me that you are my wife for me to hate you if you were the wife of any other man i owe you might have charms and etc i who listened was astonished how could you go on after this said i my dear why did you not return to your father's because she said i had not a conception he was in earnest because i reckoned it was a bad jest and told him so that my opinions of him were very different from his of himself otherwise he would not find me by his side he laughed it over when he saw me appear hurt and i forgot what had passed till forced to remember it 
i believe he was pleased with me too for a little while i suppose it had escaped his memory that i was his wife End quote. but she described the happiness they enjoyed to have been unequal and perturbed her situation in a short time might have entitled her to some tenderness but she made no claim on him for any he sometimes reproached her for the motives that had induced her to marry him all was vanity quote, the vanity of miss milbank carrying the point of reforming lord byron he always knew her inducements her pride shut her eyes to his he wished to build up his character and his fortunes both were somewhat deranged she had a high name and would have a fortune worth his attention let her look to that for his motives oh byron byron she said how you desolate me he would then accuse himself of being mad and throw himself on the ground in a frenzy which she believed was affected to conceal the coldness and malignity of his heart an affectation which at that time never failed to meet with the tenderest commiseration i could find by some implications not followed up by me lest she might have condemned herself afterwards for the involuntary disclosures that he soon attempted to corrupt her principles both with respect to her own conduct and her latitude for his she saw the precipice on which she stood and kept his sister with her as much as possible he returned in the evenings from the haunts of vice where he made her understand he had been with manners so profligate oh the wretch said i and he had no moments of remorse sometimes he appeared to have them one night coming home from one of his lawless parties he saw me so indignantly collected and bearing all with such a determined calmness that a rush of remorse seemed to come over him he called himself a monster though his sister was present and threw himself in agony at my feet claiming i could not no i could not forgive him such injuries he had lost me for ever astonished at the return of virtue my tears i believe flowed over his face and i said byron all is forgotten never never shall you hear of it more he started up and folding his arms while he looked at me burst into laughter what do you mean said i only a philosophical experiment that's all said he i wish to ascertain the value of your resolutions i need not say more of this prince of duplicity except that varied were his methods of rendering her wretched even to the last when her lovely little child was born and it was laid beside its mother on the bed and he was informed he might see his daughter after gazing at it with an exulting smile this was the ejaculation that broke from him oh what an implement of torture have i acquired in you such he rendered it by his eyes and manner keeping her in a perpetual alarm for its safety when in her presence all this reads madder than i believe he was but she had not then made up her mind to disbelieve his pretended insanity and conceived it best to entrust her secret with the excellent dr bailey telling him all that seemed to regard the state of her husband's mind and letting his advice regulate her conduct bailey doubted of his derangement but as he did not reckon his own opinion infallible he wished her to take precautions as if her husband were so he recommended her going to the country but to give him no suspicion of her intentions of remaining there and for a short time to show no coldness in her letters till she could better ascertain his state she went regretting as she told me to wear any semblance but the truth a short time disclosed the story to the world he acted the part of a man driven to despair by her inflexible resentment and by the arts of a governess once a servant in the family who hated him i will give you proceeds lady anne a few paragraphs transcribed from one of lady byron's own letters to me it is sorrowful to think that in a very little time this young and amiable creature wise patient and feeling will have her character mistaken by every one who reads byron's works to rescue her from this i preserved her letters and when she afterwards expressed a fear that anything of her writing should ever fall into hands to injure him i suppose she meant by publication i safely assured her that it never should but here this letter shall be placed a sacred record in her favour unknown to herself and here is lady byron's letter Quote, 
i am a very incompetent judge of the impression which the last canto of child harold may produce on the minds of indifferent readers it contains the usual trace of a conscience restlessly awake though his object has been too long to aggravate its burden as if it could thus be oppressed into eternal stupor i will hope as you do that it survives for his ultimate good it was the acuteness of his remorse impenitent in its character which so long seemed to demand from my compassion to spare every resemblance of reproach every look of grief which might have said to his conscience you have made me wretched i am decidedly of opinion that he is responsible he has wished to be thought partially deranged or on the brink of it to perplex observers and prevent them from tracing effects to their real causes through all the intricacies of his conduct i was as i told you at one time the dupe of his acted insanity and clung to the former delusions in regard to the motives that concerned me personally till the whole system was laid bare he is the absolute monarch of words and uses them as bonaparte did lives for conquest without more regard to their intrinsic value considering them only as ciphers which must derive all their import from the situation in which he places them and the ends to which he adapts them with such consummate skill why then you will say does he not employ them to give a better colour to his own character because he is too good an actor to overact or to assume a moral garb which it would be easy to strip off in regard to his poetry egotism is the vital principle of his imagination which it is difficult for him to kindle on any subject with which his own character and interests are not identified but by the introduction of fictitious incidents by change of scene or time he has enveloped his poetical disclosures in a system impenetrable except to a very few and his constant desire of creating a sensation makes him not averse to being the object of wonder and curiosity even though accompanied by some dark and vague suspicions nothing has contributed more to the misunderstanding of his real character than the lonely grandeur in which he shrouds it and his affectation of being above mankind when he exists almost in their voice the romance of his sentiments is another feature of this mask of state i know no one more habitually destitute of that enthusiasm he so beautifully expresses and to which he can work up his fancy chiefly by contagion i had heard he was the best of brothers the most generous of friends and i thought such feelings only required to be warmed and cherished into more diffusive benevolence though these opinions are eradicated and could never return but with the decay of my memory you will not wonder if there are still moments when the association of feelings which arouse from them soften and sadden my thoughts but i have not thanked you dearest lady anne for your kindness in regard to a principal object that of rectifying false impressions i trust you understand my wishes which never were to injure lord byron in any way for though he would not suffer me to remain his wife he cannot prevent me from continuing his friend and it was from considering myself as such that i silenced the accusations by which my own conduct might have been more fully satisfied it is not necessary to speak ill of his heart in general it is sufficient that to me it was hard and impenetrable that my own must have been broken before his could have been touched i would rather represent this as my misfortune than as his guilt but surely that misfortune is not to be made my crime so are my feelings you will judge how to act his allusions to me in child harold are cruel and cold but with such a semblance as to make me appear so and to attract all sympathy to himself it is said in this poem that hatred of him will be taught as a lesson to his child i might appeal to all who have ever heard me speak of him and still more to my own heart to witness that there has been no moment when i have remembered injury otherwise than affectionately and sorrowfully it is not my duty to give way to hopeless and wholly unrequited affection but so long as i live my chief struggle will probably be not to remember him too kindly i do not seek the sympathy of the world but i wish to be known by those whose opinion is valuable and whose kindness is dear to me 
among such my dear lady anne you will ever be remembered by your truly affectionate a byron back to lord lindsay it is the province of your readers and of the world at large to judge between the two testimonies now before them lady byron's in eighteen sixteen and eighteen eighteen and that put forward in eighteen sixty nine by mrs b stowe as communicated by lady byron thirteen years ago in the face of the evidence now given positive negative and circumstantial there can be but two alternatives in the case either mrs b stowe must have entirely misunderstood lady byron and been thus led into error and misstatement or we must conclude that under the pressure of a lifelong of secret sorrow lady byron's mind had become clouded with an hallucination in respect of the particular point in question the reader will admire the noble but severe character displayed in lady byron's letter but those who keep in view what her first impressions were as above recorded may probably place a more lenient interpretation than hers upon some of the incidents alleged to byron's discredit i shall conclude with some remarks upon his character written shortly after his death by a wise virtuous and charitable judge the late sir walter scott likewise in a letter to lady anne bernard and here is walter scott's letter fletcher's account of poor byron is extremely interesting i had always a strong attachment to that unfortunate though most richly gifted man because i thought i saw that his virtues and he had many were his own and his eccentricities the result of an irritable temperament which sometimes approached nearly to mental disease those who are gifted with strong nerves a regular temper and habitual self-command are not perhaps aware how much of what they may think virtue they owe to constitution and such are but too severe judges of men like byron whose mind like a day of alternate storm and sunshine is all dark shades and stray gleams of light instead of the twilight gray which illuminates happier though less distinguished mortals i always thought that when a moral proposition was placed plainly before lord byron his mind yielded a pleased and willing assent to it but if there was any side view given in the way of raillery or otherwise he was willing enough to evade conviction it augurs ill for the cause of greece that this master spirit should have been withdrawn from their assistance just as he was obtaining a complete ascendancy over their councils i have seen several letters from the ionian islands all of which unite in speaking in the highest praise of the wisdom and temperance of his counsels and the ascendancy he was obtaining over the turbulent and ferocious chiefs of the insurgents i have some verses written by him on his last birthday they breathe a spirit of affection towards his wife and a desire of dying in battle which seems like an anticipation of his approaching fate End of sir walter scott quote. I remain, sir, your obedient servant, Lindsay. Dunette, September 3rd. This ends Chapter 2, Lord Lindsay's Letter to the London Times. Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 3, Chapter 3 of Lady Byron Vindicated, A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 in this miscellaneous documents collection. Dr. Forbes Winslow's Letter to the London Times. To the Editor. Sir, your paper of the 4th of September containing an able and deeply interesting vindication of lord byron has followed me to this place with the general details of the true story as it is termed of lady byron's separation from her husband as recorded in macmillan's magazine i have no desire or intention to grapple it is only with the hypothesis of insanity as suggested by the clever writer of the vindication to account for lady byron's sad revelations to mrs beecher stowe with which i propose to deal i do not believe that the mooted theory of mental aberration can in this case be for a moment maintained 
if lady byron's statement of facts to mrs b stowe is to be viewed as the creation of a distempered fancy a delusion or hallucination of an insane mind what part of the narrative are we to draw the boundary line between fact and delusion sanity and insanity where are we to fix the point d'appui of the lunacy again is the alleged hallucination to be considered as strictly confined to the idea that lord byron had committed a frightful sin of incest or is the whole of the true story of her married life as reproduced with such terrible minuteness by mrs beecher stowe to be viewed as the delusion of a disordered fancy if lady byron was the subject of an hallucination with regard to her husband i think it not unreasonable to conclude that the mental alienation existed on the day of her marriage if this proposition be accepted the natural inference will be that the details of the conversation which lady byron represents to have occurred between herself and lord byron as soon as they entered the carriage never took place lord byron is said to have remarked to lady byron quote, you might have prevented this or words to this effect you will now find that you have married a devil is this alleged conversation to be viewed as fact or fiction evidence of sanity or insanity is the revelation which lord byron is said to have made to his wife of his incestuous passion another delusion having no foundation except in his wife's disordered imagination are his alleged attempts to justify to lady byron's mind the morale of the plea of quote, continental latitude the good-humoured marriage in which complacent couples mutually agree to form the cloak for each other's infidelities end quote. another morbid perversion of her imagination did this conversation ever take place it will be difficult to separate one part of the true story from another and maintain that this portion indicates insanity and that portion represents sanity if we accept the hypothesis of hallucination we are bound to view the whole of lady byron's conversations with mrs b stowe and the written statement laid before her as the wild and incoherent representations of a lunatic on the day when lady byron parted from her husband did she enter his private room and find him with the object of his guilty passion and did he say as they parted when shall we three meet again is this to be considered as an actual occurrence or as another form of hallucination it is quite inconsistent with the theory of lady byron's insanity to imagine that her delusion was restricted to the idea of his having committed incest in common fairness we are bound to view the aggregate mental phenomena which she exhibited from the day of the marriage to their final separation and her death no person practically acquainted with the true characteristics of insanity would affirm that had this idea of incest been an insane hallucination lady byron could from the lengthened period which intervened between her unhappy marriage and death have refrained from exhibiting her mental alienation not only to her legal advisers and trustees but to others exacting no pledge of secrecy from them as to her disordered impressions lunatics do for a time and for some special purpose most cunningly conceal their delusions but they have not the capacity to struggle for thirty-six years with a frightful hallucination similar to the one lady byron is alleged to have had without the insane state of mind becoming obvious to those with whom they are daily associating neither is it consistent with experience to suppose that if lady byron had been a monomaniac her state of disordered understanding would have been restricted to one hallucination her diseased brain affecting the normal action of thought would in all probability have manifested other symptoms besides those referred to of aberration of intellect during the last thirty years i have not met with a case of insanity assuming the hypothesis of hallucination at all parallel with that of lady byron's in my experience it is unique i never saw a patient with such a delusion if it should be established by the statements of those who are the depositors of the secret and they are now bound in vindication of lord byron's memory to deny if they have the power of doing so this most frightful accusation that the idea of incest did unhappily cross lady byron's mind prior to her finally leaving him 
it no doubt arose from a most inaccurate knowledge of facts and perfectly unjustifiable data and was not in the right psychological acceptation of the phrase an insane hallucination sir i remain your obedient servant forbes winslow m d Zaringerhof, Freisberg und Breisgau, September 8, 1869. This ends Chapter 3, Part 3, Dr. Forbes Winslow's Letter to the London Times, read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Part 3, Chapter 4 of Lady Byron Vindicated, A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 of these miscellaneous documents. Extract from Lord Byron's expunged letter to Murray. To Mr. Murray, Bologna, June 7, 1819 before i left venice i had returned to you your late and mr hobhouse's sheets of one don't wait for further answers from me but address yours to venice as usual i know nothing of my own movements i may return there in a few days or not for some time all this depends on circumstances i left mr hopner very well my daughter allegra is well too and is growing pretty her hair is growing darker and her eyes are blue her temper and her ways mr hopner says are like mine as well as her features she will make in that case a manageable young lady i have never seen anything of ada the little electra of my mycenae but there will come a day of reckoning even if i should not live to see it i have at least seen shivered who was one of my assassins when that man was doing his worst to uproot my whole family tree branch and blossoms when after taking my retainer he went over to them when he was bringing desolation on my hearth and destruction on my household gods did he think that in less than three years a natural event a severe domestic but an expected and common calamity would lay his carcass in a crossroad or stamp his name in a verdict of lunacy did he who in his sexagenary dot 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 reflect or consider what my feelings must have been when wife and child and sister and name and fame and country were to be my sacrifice on his legal altar and this at a moment when my health was declining my fortune embarrassed and my mind had been shaken by many kinds of disappointment while i was yet young and might have reformed what might be wrong in my conduct and retrieved what was perplexing in my affairs but he is in his grave and what a long letter i have scribbled this ends chapter three part four of miscellaneous documents extract from lord byron's expunged letter to murray read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana part three section five of lady byron vindicated a history of the byron controversy by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five in this collection of miscellaneous documents extracts from blackwood's magazine in order that the reader may measure the change of moral tone with regard to lord byron wrought by the constant efforts of himself and his party we give the two following extracts from blackwood the first is blackwood in eighteen nineteen just after the publication of don juan the second is blackwood in eighteen twenty five Quote, in the composition of this work there is unquestionably a more thorough and intense infusion of genius and vice power and profligacy than in any poem which had ever before been written in the english or indeed in any other modern language had the wickedness been less inextricably mingled with the beauty and the grace and the strength of a most inimitable and incomprehensible muse our task would have been easy don juan is by far the most admirable specimen of the mixture of ease strength gaiety and seriousness extant in the whole body of english poetry the author has devoted his powers to the worst of purposes and passions and it increases his guilt and our sorrow that he has devoted them entire 
the moral strain of the whole poem is pitched in the lowest key love honor patriotism religion are mentioned only to be scoffed at as if their sole resting place were or ought to be in the bosoms of fools it appears in short as if this miserable man having exhausted every species of sensual gratification having drained the cup of sin even to its bitterest dregs were resolved to show us that he is no longer a human being even in his frailties but a cool unconcerned fiend laughing with a detestable glee over the whole of the better and worse elements of which human life is composed treating well nigh with equal derision the most pure of virtues and the most odious of vices dead alike to the beauty of the one and the deformity of the other a mere heartless despiser of that frail but noble humanity whose type was never exhibited in a shape of more deplorable degradation than in his own contemptuously distinct delineation of himself to confess to his maker and weep over in secret agonies the wildest and most fantastic transgressions of heart and mind is the part of a conscious sinner in whom sin has not become the sole principle of life and action but to lay bare to the eye of man and of woman all the hidden convulsions of a wicked spirit and to do all this without one symptom of contrition remorse or hesitation with a calm careless ferociousness of contented and satisfied depravity this was an insult which no man of genius had ever before dared to put upon his creator or his species impiously railing against his god madly and meanly disloyal to his sovereign and his country and brutally outraging all the best feelings of female honour affection and confidence how small a part of chivalry is that which remains to the descendant of the byrons a gloomy visor and a deadly weapon those who were acquainted as who is not with the main incidents in the private life of lord byron and who have not seen this production will scarcely believe that malignity should have carried him so far as to make him commence a filthy and impious poem with an elaborate satire on the character and manners of his wife from whom even by his own confession he has been separated only in consequence of his own cruel and heartless misconduct it is in vain for lord byron to attempt in any way to justify his own behaviour in that affair and now that he has so openly and audaciously invited inquiry and reproach we do not see any good reason why he should not be plainly told so by the general voice of his countrymen it would not be an easy matter to persuade any man who has any knowledge of the nature of woman that a female such as lord byron has himself described his wife to be would rashly or hastily or lightly separate herself from the love with which she had once been inspired for such a man as he is or was had he not heaped insult upon insult and scorn upon scorn had he not forced the iron of his contempt into her very soul there is no woman of delicacy and virtue as he admitted lady byron to be who would not have hoped all things and suffered all things from one her love of whom must have been interwoven with so many exalting elements of delicious pride and more delicious humility to offend the love of such a woman was wrong but it might be forgiven to desert her was unmanly but he might have returned and wiped for ever from her eyes the tears of her desertion but to injure and to desert and then to turn back and wound her widowed privacy with unhallowed strains of cold-blooded mockery was brutality fiendishly inexpiably mean for impurities there might be some possibility of pardon were they supposed to spring only from the reckless buoyancy of young blood and fiery passions for impiety there might at least be pity were it visible that the misery of the impious soul equalled its darkness but for offences such as this which cannot proceed either from the madness of sudden impulse or the bewildered agonies of doubt but which speak the wilful and determined spite of an unrepenting unsoftened smiling sarcastic joyous sinner there can be neither pity nor pardon our knowledge that it is committed by one of the most powerful intellects our island has ever produced lends intensity a thousandfold to the bitterness of our indignation 
every high thought that was ever kindled in our breasts by the muse of byron every pure and lofty feeling that ever responded from within us to the sweep of his majestic inspirations every remembered moment of admiration and enthusiasm is up in arms against him we look back with a mixture of wrath and scorn to the delight with which we suffered ourselves to be filled by one who all the while he was furnishing us with delight must we cannot doubt it have been mocking us with a cruel mockery less cruel only because less peculiar than that with which he has now turned him from the lurking-place of his selfish and polluted exile to pour the pitiful chalice of his contumely on the surrendered devotion of a virgin bosom and the holy hopes of the mother of his child it is indeed a sad and a humiliating thing to know that in the same year there proceeded from the same pen two productions in all things so different as the fourth canto of child harold and his loathsome don juan we have mentioned one and all will admit the worst instance of the private malignity which has been embodied in so many passages of don juan and we are quite sure the lofty-minded and virtuous men whom lord byron has debased himself by insulting will close the volume which contains their own injuries with no feelings save those of pity for him that has inflicted them and for her who partakes so largely in the same injuries august eighteen nineteen and here is the blackwood extract from eighteen ninety five quote, we shall like all others who say anything about lord byron begin sans apologie with his personal character this is the great object of attack the constant theme of open vituperation to one set and the established mark for all the petty but deadly artillery of sneers shrugs groans to another two widely different matters however are generally we might say universally mixed up here the personal character of the man as proved by his course of life and his personal character as revealed in or guessed from his books nothing can be more unfair than the style in which this mixture is made use of is there a noble sentiment a lofty thought a sublime conception in the book ah yes is the answer but what of that it is only the roué byron that speaks is it a kind a generous act of the man mentioned yes yes comments the sage but only remember the atrocities of don juan depend on it this if it be true must have been a mere freak of caprice or perhaps a bit of vile hypocrisy salvation is thus shut out at either entrance the poet damns the man and the man damns the poet nobody will suspect us of being so absurd as to suppose that it is possible for people to draw no inferences as to the character of an author from his book or to shut entirely out of view in judging of a book that which they may happen to know about the man who writes it the cant of the day supposes such things to be practicable but they are not but what we complain of and scorn is the extent to which they are carried in the case of this particular individual as compared with others the imprudence with which things are at once assumed to be facts in regard to his private history and the absolute unfairness of never arguing from his writings to him but for evil take the man in the first place as unconnected in so far as we thus consider him with his works and ask what after all are the bad things we know of him was he dishonest or dishonourable had he ever done anything to forfeit or even endanger his rank as a gentleman most assuredly no such accusations have ever been maintained against lord byron the private nobleman although something of the sort may have been insinuated against the author but he was such a profligate in his morals that his name cannot be mentioned with anything like tolerance was he so indeed we should like extremely to have the catechizing of the individual man who says so that he indulged in sensual vices to some extent is certain and to be regretted and condemned but was he worse as to such matters than the enormous majority of those who join in the cry of horror upon this occasion we most assuredly believe exactly the reverse and we rest our belief upon very plain and intelligible grounds 
first we hold it impossible that the majority of mankind or that anything beyond a very small minority are or can be entitled to talk of sensual profligacy as having formed a part of the life and character of the man who dying at six and thirty bequeathed a collection of works such as byron's to the world secondly we hold it impossible that laying the extent of his intellectual labors out of the question and looking only to the nature of the intellect which generated and delighted in generating such beautiful and noble conceptions as are to be found in almost all lord byron's works we hold it impossible that very many men can be at once capable of comprehending these conceptions and entitled to consider sensual profligacy as having formed the principal or even a principal trait in lord byron's character thirdly and lastly we have never been able to hear any one fact established which could prove lord byron to deserve anything like the degree or even the kind of odium which has in regard to matters of this class been heaped upon his name we have no story of base unmanly seduction or false or villainous intrigue against him none whatever it seems to us quite clear that if he had been at all what is called in society an unprincipled sensualist there must have been many such stories authentic and authenticated but there are none such absolutely none his name has been coupled with the names of three four or more women of some rank but what kind of women every one of them in the first place about as old as himself in years and therefore a great deal older in character every one of them utterly battered in reputation long before he came into contact with them licentious unprincipled characterless women what father has ever reproached him with the ruin of his daughter what husband has denounced him as the destroyer of his peace let us not be mistaken we are not defending the offences of which lord byron unquestionably was guilty neither are we finding fault with those who after looking honestly within and around themselves condemn those offences no matter how severely but we are speaking of society in general as it now exists and we say that there is vile hypocrisy in the tone in which lord byron is talked of there we say that although all offences against purity of life are miserable things and condemnable things the degrees of guilt attached to different offences of this class are as widely different as are the degrees of guilt between an assault and a murder and we confess our belief that no man of byron's station or age could have run much risk in gaining a very bad name in society had a course of life similar to lord byron's been the only thing chargeable against him in so far as we know anything of that the last poem he wrote was produced upon his birthday not many weeks before he died we consider it as one of the finest and most touching effusions of his noble genius we think he who reads it and can ever after bring himself to regard even the worst transgressions that have been charged against lord byron with any feelings but those of humble sorrow and manly pity is not deserving of the name of man the deep and passionate struggles with the inferior elements of his nature and ours which it records the lofty thirsting after purity the heroic devotion of a soul half weary of life because unable to believe in its own powers to live up to what it so intensely felt to be and so reverentially honored as the right the whole picture of this mighty spirit often darkened but never sunk often erring but never ceasing to see and to worship the beauty of virtue the repentance of it the anguish the aspiration almost stilled in despair the whole of this is such a whole that we are sure no man can read these solemn verses too often and we recommend them for repetition as the best and most conclusive of all possible answers whenever the name of byron is insulted by those who permit themselves to forget nothing either in his life or in his writings but the good this ends chapter three part five extracts from blackwood's magazine Read by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana.
Part three, chapter six of Lady Byron Vindicated A History of the Byron Controversy by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six of this collection of miscellaneous documents Letters of Lady Byron to H. C. Robinson. The following letters of Lady Byron's are reprinted from the memoirs of H. C. Robinson. They are given that the reader may form some judgment of the strength and activity of her mind and the elevated class of subjects upon which it habitually dwelt. Lady Byron to H. C. R. December 31, 1853. Dear Mr. Crabb Robinson, I have an inclination, if I were not afraid of trespassing on your time, but you can put my letter by for any leisure moment, to enter upon the history of a character which I think less appreciated than it ought to be. Men, I observe, do not understand men in certain points without a woman's interpretation. Those points, of course, relate to feeling here is a man taken by most of those who come his way either for dry as dust matter of fact or for vain visionary there are doubtless some defective or excessive characteristics which give rise to those impressions my acquaintance with dr king was made oddly enough twenty-seven years ago a pauper said to me of him he's the poor man's doctor such a recommendation seemed to me a good one and i also knew that his organizing head had formed the first district society in england for mrs fry told me she could not have effected it without his aid yet he has always ignored his own share of it i felt in him at once the curious combination of the christian and the cynic of reverence for man and contempt of men it was then an internal war but one in which it was evident to me that the holier cause would be victorious because there was deep belief and as far as i could learn a blameless and benevolent life he appeared only to want sunshine it was a plant which could not be brought to perfection in darkness he had begun life by the most painful conflict between filial duty and conscience a large provision in the church secured for him by his father but he could not sign there was discredit as you know attached to such scruples he was also when i first knew him under other circumstances of a nature to depress him and to make him feel that he was unjustly treated the gradual removal of these called forth his better nature in thankfulness to god still the old misanthropic modes of expressing himself obtruded themselves at times this passed in forty eight between him and robertson robertson said to me i want to know something about ragged schools i replied you had better ask dr king he knows more about them i said dr king i take care to know nothing of ragged schools lest they should make me ragged robertson did not see through it perhaps i had been taught to understand such suicidal speeches by my cousin lord melbourne the example of christ imperfectly as it may be understood by him has been ever before his eyes he woke to the thought of following it and he went to rest consoled or rebuked by it after nearly thirty years of intimacy i may without presumption form that opinion there is something pathetic to me in seeing any one so unknown even the other medical friends of robertson when i knew that dr king felt a woman's tenderness said on one occasion to him but we know that you dr king are above all feeling if i have made the character more consistent to you by putting in these bits of mosaic my pen will not have been ill-employed nor unpleasing to you yours truly a noel byron next letter lady byron to h c r brighton november fifteenth eighteen fifty four the thought of all this public and private suffering have taken the life out of my pen when i tried to write on matters which would otherwise have been most interesting to me these seemed the shadows that the stern reality it is good however to be drawn out of scenes in which one is absorbed most unprofitably and to have one's natural interests revived by such a letter as i have to thank you for as well as its predecessor 
you touch upon the very points which do interest me the most habitually the change of form and enlargement of design in the perspective had led me to express to one of the promoters of that object my desire to contribute the religious crisis is instant but the man for it the next best thing if as i believe he is not to be found in england is an association of such men as are to edit the new periodical an address delivered by freeman clark at boston last may makes me think him better fitted for a leader than any other of the religious freethinkers i wish i could send you my one copy but you do not need it and others do his object is the same as that of the alliance universelle only he is still more free from partalism his own word in his aspirations and practical suggestions with respect to an ultimate christian synthesis he so far adopts kant's theory as to speak of religion itself under three successive aspects historically one thesis two antithesis three synthesis i made his acquaintance in england and he inspired confidence at once by his brave independence in contus capitalis and self-unconsciousness j j taylor's address of last month follows in the same path all in favor of irenics instead of polemics the answer which you gave me so fully and distinctly to the questions i proposed for your consideration was of value in turning to my view certain aspects of the case which i had not observed before i had begun a second attack on your patience when all was forgotten in the news of the day next letter lady byron to h c r brighton december twenty fifth eighteen fifty four with j j taylor though almost a stranger to him i have a peculiar reason for sympathizing a book of his was a treasure to my daughter on her deathbed footnote probably the christian aspects of faith and duty mr taylor has also written a retrospect of the religious life of england and footnote i must confess to intolerance of opinion as to these two points eternal evil in any form and involved in it eternal suffering to believe in these would take away my god who is all loving with a god with whom omnipotence and omniscience were all evil might be eternal but why do i say to you what has been better said elsewhere End quote. next letter lady byron to h c r brighton january thirty first eighteen fifty five the great difficulty in respect to the national review seems to be to settle a basis inclusive and exclusive in short a boundary question from what you said i think you agreed with me that a latitudinarian christianity ought to be the character of the periodical but the depth of the roots should correspond with the width of the branches of that tree of knowledge of some of those minds one might say they have no root and then the richer the foliage the more danger that the trunk will fall grounded in christ has to me a most practical significance and value i too have anxiety about a friend miss carpenter whose life is of public importance she more than any of the english reformers unless nash and wright has found the art of drawing out the good of human nature and proving its existence she makes these discoveries by the light of love i hope she may recover from today's report the object of the reformatory in leicester has just been secured at a county meeting now the desideratum is well qualified masters and mistresses if you hear of such by chance pray let me know the regular schoolmaster is an extinguisher heart and familiarity with the class to be educated are all important at home and abroad the evidence is conclusive on that point for i have for many years attended to such experiments in various parts of europe the irish quarterly has taken up the subject with rather more zeal than judgment i had hoped that a sound and temperate exposition of the facts might form an article in the might have been review 
next letter lady byron to h c r brighton february twelfth eighteen fifty five i have at last earned the pleasure of writing to you by having settled troublesome matters of little moment except locally and i gladly take a wider range by sympathizing in your interests there is besides no responsibility for me at least in canvassing the merits of russell or palmerston but much in deciding whether the village politician jackson or thompson shall be leader in the school or public house has not the nation been brought to a conviction that the system should be broken up and is lord palmerston who has used it so long and so cleverly likely to promote that object but whatever obstacles there may be in state affairs that general persuasion must modify other departments of action and knowledge unroasted coffee will no longer be accepted under the official seal another reason for a new literary combination for distinct special objects a review in which every separate article should be convergent if instead of the problem to make a circle pass through three given points it were required to find the centre from which to describe a circle through any three articles in the edinburgh or westminster review who would accomplish it much force is lost for want of this one-mindedness among the contributors it would not exclude variety or freedom in the unlimited discussion of means towards the ends unequivocally recognized if st paul had edited a review he might have admitted peter as well as luke or barnabas ross gave us an excellent sermon yesterday on hallowing the name though far from commonplace it might have been delivered in any church we have had fanny kimball here last week i only heard her romeo and juliet not less instructive as her readings always are than exciting for in her glass shakespeare is a philosopher i know her and honor her for her truthfulness amidst all trials next letter lady byron to h c r brighton march fifth eighteen fifty five i recollect only those passages of dr kennedy's book which bear upon the opinions of lord byron strange as it may seem dr kennedy is most faithful where you doubt his being so not merely from casual expressions but from the whole tenor of lord byron's feelings i could not but conclude he was a believer in the inspiration of the bible and had the gloomiest calvinistic tenets to that unhappy view of the relation of the creature to the creator i have always ascribed the misery of byron's life it is enough for me to remember that he who thinks his transgressions beyond forgiveness and such was his own deepest feeling has righteousness beyond that of the self-satisfied sinner or perhaps of the half-awakened it was impossible for me to doubt that could he have been at once assured of pardon his living faith in a moral duty and love of virtue i love the virtues which i cannot claim he said would have conquered every temptation judge then how i must hate the creed which made him see god as an avenger not a father my own impressions were just the reverse but could have little weight and it was in vain to seek to turn his thoughts for long from that id fix with which he connected his physical peculiarity as a stamp instead of being made happier by any apparent good he felt convinced that every blessing would be turned into a curse to him who possessed by such ideas could lead a life of love and service to god or man they must in a measure realize themselves the worst of it is i do believe he said i like all connected with him was broken against the rock of predestination i may be pardoned for referring to his frequent expression of the sentiment that i was only sent to show him the happiness he was forbidden to enjoy you will now better understand why the deformed transformed is too painful to me for discussion since writing the above i have read dr granville's letter on the emperor of russia some passages of which seem applicable to the prepossession i have described i will not mix up less serious matters with these which forty years have not made less than present still to me
next letter lady byron to h c r brighton april eighth eighteen fifty five the book which has interested me most lately is that on mosaism translated by miss goldsmid and which i read as you will believe without any christian unchristian prejudice the missionaries of the unity were always from my childhood regarded by me as in that sense the people and i believe they were true to that mission though blind intellectually in demanding the crucifixion the present aspect of jewish opinions as shown in that book is all but christian the author is under the error of taking as the representatives of christianity the mystics ascetics and quietists and therefore he does not know how near he is to the true spirit of the gospel if you should happen to see miss goldsmid pray tell her what a great service i think she has rendered to the soi distant christians in translating a book which must make us sensible of the little we have done and the much we have to do to justify our preference of the later to the earlier dispensation next letter lady byron to h c r brighton april eleventh eighteen fifty five you appear to have more definite information respecting the review than i have obtained it was also said that the review would in fact be the prospective amplified not satisfactory to me because i have always thought that periodical too unitarian in the sense of separating itself from other christian churches if not by a high wall at least by a wire gauze fence now separation is to me the ipoetic the revelation through nature never separates it is the revelation through the book which separates whewell and brewster would have been one had they not i think equally dimmed their lamps of science when reading their bibles as long as we think a truth better for being shut up in a text we are not of the wide world religion which is to include all in one fold for that text will not be accepted by the followers of other books or students of the same and separation will ensue the christian scripture should be dear to us not as the charter of a few but of mankind and to fashion it into cages is to deny its ultimate objects these thoughts hot like the roll at breakfast where your letter was so welcome an addition this ends section six of miscellaneous documents letters of lady byron to h c robinson read by michelle fry baton rouge louisiana